to introduce myself. It's a bit scary, that statement, isn't it, really? <laughs> I always feel scared when I hear that. Continue. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is um, Dr. Andrew Taylor. I have the dubious pleasure of being Managing Director of Transylvania Executive Education. Um, I'm also a management consultant and I teach on the um, MBA program here and I teach on a couple of other university MBA programs in different locations around the world. Um, Transylvania Executive Education is a non-governmental organization, a not-for-profit enterprise that exists for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to, in, to bring global level executive education to Cluj and Transylvania to ensure that Cluj and Transylvania thrive as centers of entrepreneurialism within global marketplaces. So that's our purpose. We were created by a group of stakeholders that includes two of the major universities, includes UBB and UTCN, and some of the larger um, business organizations from the city, Bank of Transylvania, Emerson, E-Infra, um, and we also have on our board directors from Endava and also the British um, Consul to Transylvania and the Dutch Consul to Transylvania. So it's a very broadly based organization. Essentially, in short, we seek to be a hub of knowledge that facilitates participation in global business. Um, we have just launched our new MBA program. In the past, we were effectively the agents hosting and recruiting for a British university. We are now just launched a new program, which is in some ways similar to what we did previously, but with a renewed focus on quality. So we will be delivering an annual class, which is slightly different to what we did previously. We have introduced two new modules to the MBA. So one of them is called Complexity and Digital Disruption. And the second one is called Corporate Governance and is with a renewed focus on thinking about entrepreneurialism with regard to questions, ethical questions around um, social impact and ecological relationships. And um, we will be bringing in a new staff to deliver the program that perhaps we haven't, and one of whom is one of the module leaders for this program that we hope to bring over is Professor David Menikoff. Um, and we're also hoping to be bringing for every module speakers such as Karina Marafa, who I'll introduce in a few minutes or moments also, um, and also some of our alumni and business leaders from Cluj, such as our other guest today, Christina Vladoyu from Steelcase. So our topic today is to talk about the supply chain and its relationship to sustainability and its capacity to drive societal innovation. But before we go any further, I'd just like to introduce our guests today, or in fact, rather what I'd really like to do is ask them to introduce themselves. So um, perhaps Karina Morafa, if you'd like to just start and um, introduce yourself, please. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. I'll be really brief. My name is Corina Murafa. I currently sit in Bucharest, Romania, but I lead a global program uh, on planet and climate of Ashoka, which is the largest global network of social entrepreneurs. Um, and I have a background in energy policy, climate policy, sustainability. Um, I also uh, teach myself uh, a module at uh, the Master in Business Administration on Energy in Bucharest, Romania, of ASE, um, because of my um, yeah, energy background. And it's really wonderful to be with so many Transylvanians today. Uh, one of my favorite uh, people in the world, if I may call you folks a people, but uh, I, I think I definitely can. So lo really looking forward to, to exchanging some ideas on how we could innovate, given how uh, booming the Transylvanian economy is um, in this space uh, and how to create more equity and sustainability. Thank you very much, Karina. Um, David, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, um, I'm David Menikoff. I'm currently an associate professor of supply chain and operations management at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, Florida, down near Miami. Uh, previously, I was a professor in port logistics at the University of Hull and prior to that, several other universities spending about 20 years in the UK before coming back to the US. I've spent, as 
much further back in time. I was a Fulbright scholar and spent a year in Odessa, Ukraine, and currently uh, doing research in global supply chain issues, uh, supply chain security, risk visibility, uh, sustainable supply chains, and liner shipping and containerization are kind of my uh, main interests. Thank you very much, David. Um, so, Christina Vladoya, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, thank you very much, Andy. So, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. I'll be as well very brief. My name is Christina Vladoyu. I'm very excited to, to be here tonight. I think there's a learning, a continuous learning opportunity, even if you're a panelist, uh, of course, with maybe just a little bit more, uh, more stress around. <laughs> So thank you very much, uh, Andy. I think it's wonderful to, to continue this close relation, which uh, has started uh, around uh, three years ago, four, uh, almost four years ago, when, uh, when I joined uh, the uh, HAL uh, uh, Executive uh, Education, uh, and uh, we, we started our journey together. I'm currently uh, for actually six years working in furniture uh, manufacturing industry uh, and responsible for uh, our uh, operations team in Cluj. Uh, this meaning actually the, the, in the core functions involved within the supply chain. And uh, kind of that's, that's it in brief about me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, um, Christina. And it's really, really good to see how you've kind of thrived subsequent to the MBO. It's, it's very pleasing. Um, just to start, David, um, can I throw you a question first of all? Um, it looks to me, watching television, um, as if the world supply chain is in a, some kind of global crisis or at least a series of overlapping crises. Um, is this true? And is this in any way connected to questions of sustainability for you, David? Um, an interesting way to put that. Um, on one hand, I've described it as a black swan in a perfect storm. Um, you know, this has just been unprecedented, uh, the shock to the supply chain. And for all the companies where we teach you to be lean, and pare down your inventory, and all of a sudden you can't get the inventory, you don't have a kind of the backup to keep moving. And so all of these uh, semiconductor chips that uh, you had mentioned earlier, Andy, um, you know, they're stopping production further down the line because all these components um, are just not uh, in the right place or in the the right level of production, and even if they're at 100%, they cannot make up uh, the volume um, for what's being demanded. Um, at the moment, uh, I know here in the US, there's over 100 container ships waiting off the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And these aren't the small container ships, these are the massive 14, 15,000 TEU ships that are just waiting out there. And they've sped them across the ocean because they want to discharge the cargo, get them back because of the extremely high container rates. But they now just sit there and all of that speed rushing them over, which is more pollution, uh, less environmental uh, going on. And now they can't discharge their cargoes. And we add to that. Uh, so I guess I am relating it to some sustainable aspects because when everything gets slowed down, everything takes longer, more energy is taken. And in the ports themselves, and this is ports um, in Europe, in China, they're all the same in terms of being so filled up. And I don't know if you remember as a child, there were these little tiny games that had 15 numbers that you had to slide around the board with 16 squares. And so to get to one, you have to move another piece. 
And that's what's happening at these ports is you can't just grab the container and move it out. You're shifting two or three containers to get to the one you want, which adds to the time, adds to the delay. So it's one of these that uh, it's almost like molasses. Um, everything is just slowed down. In terms of, you know, the other side of the crisis, yes, semiconductor chips and critical parts for uh, manufacturing for high tech are missing. But, you know, it, it, over here, I assume you're also all familiar with Capri Sun, the little juice in the packets. And right now, okay, we can't get every flavor on the supermarket shelves. You know, is that a crisis? Well, you know, we just have to adapt a little bit and drink fruit punch instead of the, the cranberry cooler. Um, but we've got now pent up consumer demand from when we were all in lockdown, couldn't spend our money. We've got the disruption of the production. And so we've got a transportation network that just cannot cope uh, with the volume that we're trying to push from one end to the other and get it out to the consumers. Uh, they say there's almost a half a million containers sitting off the port of Los Angeles. And that relates to a lot of cargo, a lot of goods, but we just cannot get them. And the question is, is it port capacity? Is it crane efficiency? The lack of truck drivers. I know we've, uh, when I was in the UK, that's always been a problem saying we don't have enough truck drivers. The lack of container chassis to put the containers on, the lack of rail capacity, the lack of warehouse space. So you name it, um, people are, are saying it's causing a problem. Um, it will work itself out over time, but in the intermediate, we're going to have to accept that from previously using lean supply chains, we don't have the, the safety stock levels that could handle such a disruption at this point in time. Thank you, David. That's a really detailed sort of analysis of that picture. I appreciate that. Just before we sort of go on, um, and I was wondering, is there anybody in the audience that in their organization is currently experiencing either shortages as a result of global supply chain problems or the consequences of other people's shortages? Is there anybody in the audience experiencing that? If there are, either just speak up or put your hand up either way. Anybody here who's feeling that in their company? Hello, Andy. I can I can uh, add uh, something to that. Hi, I'm Sorin from from Ian. Yes, uh, definitely we are uh, involved with uh, numbers of uh, shipments regarding uh, mostly PV panels, inverters, and uh, other renewable efficiency equipments which we install to our clients. And we uh, have uh, shortages because of the COVID crisis and also because of the increased prices in, in transportation. So since I think a year, a year and a half ago, the price uh, of, of, the, of the PV panels mostly, which for more than 10, 15 years decreased on a, a daily basis practically. Uh, the price is now... Uh, increased quite quite dramatically and most of the the price uh, increase was based also on the transportation fees which increased from a few thousand euros per container to almost twenty thousand right so that's a dramatic increase in cost yeah that's really quite dramatic and also if there are absolute shortages and this leads me to a question that maybe is for karina um is this one of those cases where we need to think about not just kind of doing more with what we've got, but actually we may actually have to start thinking about not only doing more with less, but actually doing less with less. Is it one of those situations where the world, the world supply chains have become too robust, but insufficiently resilient? Do, if you, does, that, does that make sense to you, Karina, or am I wrong? Um, it does quite a bit. And I think that 
we really need a, a massive and large scale transformation of our economies to uh, indeed sort of nurture that level of resilience. Uh, but at the same time, in my opinion, um, we really need to shift from an old paradigm in which we figured out that all these issues related to climate action, um, climate change, planet and climate is, um, are, are things that somebody else needs to fix, um, either the government or scientists or whoever out there. But what we're seeing with our global network of social entrepreneurs is that they are um, giving everybody a role and a voice um, and the stake at the play uh, and, the, um, and the stake at the table in this big game of uh, you know driving sustainability. And I think it's really about that. It's um, how do we all um, become more responsible and how do we all, um, you know, not necessarily become the Greta Thunbergs of the world overnight because that would not be um, realistic and probably also not desirable, but how do we um, build a new decision-making architecture in which we have a planet and climate lens to everything that we do in our personal and in our professional capacity. And very often in both of these capacities, we are buyers. Um, so, you know, the idea of having, uh, you know, this traditionally boring, tedious, nitty gritty profession of procurement, supply, cha supply chain, um, analyst, developer, and so on, it, it all of a sudden becomes a much more interesting and exciting game to play because it's really about um, driving this, this massive change. Um, because um, I, I fundamentally think that one of the, um, that, that, that climate change is the most scandalous and utterly the, the most serious market failure of all times. Um, it's definitely the markets that did it because we failed to price in the negative externalities of um, our action and also the positive ones that, uh, you know, we failed to account for all the positive externalities that nature is giving us. Um, and essentially, you know, it's, it's up to the markets to sort of solve it. And it's up to the markets to sort of find new, new, new solutions. And um, I could uh, perhaps in, in a subsequent intervention um, share with you a couple of examples of, of social entrepreneurs um, driving this change in, um, in very different supply chains uh, around the world from the pulp and paper industry to the food um, industry to even like um, urban um, landscape uh, management in cities. Um, but ultimately everywhere uh, around, um, I, I think this is what needs to come out. The fact that we all have a role to play, whether we are a procurement specialist or a marketing specialist or a business development specialist in a company or whether we're a social entrepreneur or a public official in the local public administration of the city um, that we live in. Um, if we all had this uh, realization that we really literally have a decade to act in order to create a, a livable conditions, conditions of, of life for our kids um, and for our grandchildren, uh, we would completely act, act different. And that actually will bring us to making more sustainable choices, more to building more resilient supply chains, as you said, um, Andy. And it's true that perhaps, you know, we, we will not be able to, um, outdo uh, some of the, and we shouldn't, some of the very positive consequences of, of globalized capitalism. But we need to also become aware that there are some very negative consequences of global capitalism that we, we must revert. And it is through the power of the market that we can do that uh, by creating, um, you know, in some areas, not in all of them, more sustainable, shorter supply chains, uh, localizing our uh, purchasing powers more into the local and regional um, ecosystem and in the bioregional ecosystem. Um, and I think we're now living this, this age of transition in which the new model seems to emerge. Um, and somehow, you know, social entrepreneurs that, that we bring together in our network are showing these um, flickers of, of, of emergency of what's next. Uh, but at the same time, we, we live our, our lives in, in this current setup and in the current system of the global economy. And we're sort of trying to, to bring these, these flickers from the future into our daily business. And um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a fascinating development. And 
um, it's exciting to, to look at how something that used to be super, <clears throat> you know, um, innovative or, or out of the box five years ago now becomes part of the consumer's choices, consumer's preferences, uh, retailers driving it and so on. I think the world is changing and it's changing faster than we're thinking. But it has to because we really need to to drive more sustainability and more equity into global economy, essentially. Thank you very much, Karina. That was a really detailed answer and actually kind of reminded me of something I read in the Times newspaper earlier this week. Um, and um, what they did was they did an interview with a supermarket manager. And of course, the supermarkets in the UK, are, uh, they're basically facing very large numbers of empty shelves. Um, and the supermarket manager was saying that he was suddenly faced with a situation where the things that he'd ordered, he said, like, when we get flowers coming in from Nairobi, we can get those, but we're not able to get basic foodstuffs because the supply chains that bring them across the sea aren't functioning for us. And he said, for the first time, I was starting to realize the incredible stupidity of the situation I'm finding myself in. And the realization that we do actually need to think about the length of supply chains and their overall resilience, rather than just what, what's the margin we can squeeze by getting it from somewhere cheaper. And, and so I kind of, I, the, I was thinking about this, and then I realized that actually these are the sorts of questions that people like Christina Vladoyo are dealing with every day in terms of the way that she thinks about her purchasing and her supply chain. So maybe you want to say have a few words about that, Christina. Sure, Andy. Thank you. And uh, actually, it's interesting the analogy uh, you've made with the supply, the, the fact that we have extremely in many cases, extremely long supply chains. And yes, of course, each company would run for the profit but there's more, a lot more to it. And uh, with the analogy you've made, I, I, I started to smile because um, there's actually nothing necessarily new to, to the table or just arising now. If we're looking even back uh, into the origins of, for example, of lean management practices, they would always encourage, let's say, a balanced approach in between local supply and maybe outsourced or a uh, long distance supply. So I don't think it's something new, but something that uh, we need to be maybe more intentional in building our, our supply chains. And I was listening to, to you, Corinna, as well in, in a call for collaboration, let's say, in a call of joint responsibility. And I think this is a, a key element of success at least this is the path that I, I must say we, we have taken for, for the last years. And actually there's more than a decade. So there are partners, there are suppliers that we partner with, uh, there are um, organizations across the globe because there are along the supply chain, suppliers are willing to support this journey. For example, I do recall many years ago when we have started to uh, trace, for example, um, uh, we have started to trace the, uh, the minerals uh, and uh, that we're using and so on. So the first contact with, uh, with our suppliers was extremely challenging, not understanding what we want from them, what do we need that and so on. But along the way, we work together and um, now it's so easy or it's easy. It's easier than it has been. It's uh, never an easy or it's in a intensive work to track along the supply chain, the information but it's easy as long as you have the support and the backup of your suppliers with whom you work in close partnership, with whom uh, you build a relation, you build a common purpose. This is why, for example, um, one of our ambitions is, and actually a very aggressive target is by that by 2025, to have our 80% of our suppliers, have them have their own uh, target in terms of sustainability and to have their own target science base, the same that we have applied uh, within our company. So help them achieve that, that, uh, that level as well. And we started a long time ago, our journey, for example, uh, I do remember in 
2000, around 2011, we started to, to partner with CDP Climate Change and uh, working over the last decade in a persistent and I'd say intensive manner, we managed to improve our score in terms of climate change performance into a B just in 2020. Um, we are also partnering with uh, and uh, in, uh, in supply chain uh, performance and uh, we got we actually managed to to get an a uh, an a scoring uh, from the same organization so there are organizations with whom they can guide you they you can learn from they can guide you in this journey you can partner with in creating a better tomorrow than it is today Okay, that's a very powerful statement to finish on there, Christina. Thank you. But let me be very provocative here. And those of you that know me will know I enjoy being provocative. And maybe David will like this one. But um, it seems to me that particularly po during the pandemic, we entered into a kind of orgy of digital consumption that digital technology enabled us to do effectively a search for the lowest possible cost of production anywhere on Earth. Um, and this Oh, the question I have for you is, is this a binary choice between environment and tech, basically? If we want to have a globalized world where we can order whatever we like and it arrives in three or four days, is this a binary choice between that search for low price and, uh, the, the and living with the ecological consequences? Or can we have both? This is a question both for the panel and the audience, really. Who would like to come in on that? Anybody from the audience, first of all? Is this a binary choice or do you have examples where it doesn't have to be? I mean, um, I, I, I strongly believe that, um, you know, the current patterns of linear consumptions that of linear consumption that we have in our world are, are truly not sustainable. And we really need to ask ourselves, um, whether this product is something that I really need, um, whether I cannot re reduce my consumption in a certain um, um, in a certain chapter of my life, um, and I think there's you know massive amount of evidence that it can be done. And um, I think you were talking, um, Andy, about UK supermarkets. Uh, well, you know we have a UK. Uh, uh, Ashoka Fellow, Tristan Stewart, who has led essentially a, a fantastic movement uh, in British supermarkets, including Tesco, uh, to reduce uh, food waste, because uh, we are not only completely unsustainably raising our food, deforesting ancient forests in order to to grow soybeans and to, to feed our cattle and so on, but we're also wasting a, a third of the food that we produce, particularly in developed countries. And it's a very, um, you know, as Christina was saying earlier, it's, a, it's an everyone everywhere mission to work together and to educate both suppliers and consumers into, I think, first and foremost, how to consume less. Um, and, and here it's a question of, um, you know, um, um, making the right food choices, um, buying what you need, buying the amounts that you need. Um, and we could go on and on around um, different types of uh, industries. Um, I think personally, for instance, that the fast fashion industry um, is at least in, in the Western part of the world, not going to um, uh, be uh, as, as successful as it has been in the past decades or so, because consumers are increasingly aware of, of the footprint of their uh, clothing purchases. You know, the global clothing industry has um, is uh, generating 10% of global emissions. And you really do not need to buy uh, uh, three times a year t-shirts. Um, and there's, there's business that's being done, you know, from Patagonia, for instance, to um, uh, local brands and, 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 and European brands that are really having this proposition as their business, you know, like buy less, consume less. We, we are mending, uh, uh, again, the product that you brought from us so that you can use it longer and so on. So it is, uh, uh, there is this change uh, towards more durability in, in the way we, we consume. Um, there is also obviously the, the 
trend of, of reusing. Um, and I think here, you know, like circular economy mm -hmm. um, in, in Romania, for sure, it's something where we are going to catch up massively. And whether we're going to do that driven by regulation or whether we're going to do that driven by uh, consumer choices, but we are going to do that. Um, our resource utilization rate is abysmal, so we are going to be looking into um, new businesses and new models of reusing the materials that, that we have. And um, uh, you know, I, I I know we're sitting here at at the table with, with Steelcase, which has, I think you know, um, you guys have positioned yourself as this kind of premium furniture brand and kind of okay, I buy a Steelcase chair, but I'm gonna have it for a long time because it's really durable, it's really sustainable, it's never dying. But you know, even the the faster um, furniture producers and and sellers out there, they are still looking into ways of of working to to reuse the furniture that they're selling. Uh, and um, that's going to be a, a differentiator. And I think that um, maybe some of you know this um, um, Laptaria cu caimac or artesana Romanian brand like this is these are dairy products and they've managed to accumulate market share um, quite a lot uh, by uh, you know using um, uh, glass uh, containers instead of plastic containers by really working with sustainable uh, dairy uh, animal welfare um, and, and, and sustainable farming uh, techniques and so on and they're now looking into reverse logistics um, and I, I feel that this is where we're heading and it doesn't have to be a trade-off uh, necessarily, but we do have to be more conscious of the choices that we're making as consumers. And I think with the younger generations, these, these questions are, are incre increasingly becoming more important for them. Do I really new, uh, need this? If I, if I need it, do I know where it comes from? Um, you know, we have another Ashoka fellow in France, for instance, um, I don't remember, I think Gigande is his family name. Um, he, he's basically labeling products. Um, it's this kind of Wikipedia of labeling, let's put it like that, in which he's labeling food products in supermarkets that kind of like, okay, I'm, lo I'm looking at this yogurt, this is greener in terms of environmental footprint than, than the other. And that's how you know, you're educating the, the consumers, but it's everyone's job. Also the large procurement, um, large institutions that are procuring institutionally. I think this is really where a big part of the uh, solution comes in because the market is not going to move overnight 100%, but if you get some of the big players to move, then you're definitely making a, a, a difference. And you know, I can I can give you the example of an Ashoka fellow that I completely like. And you know, we, we talk um, we've talked quite a bit about this Paula Daniels from from the U.S. Uh, she's realized the power of institutional purchases of food. In the U.S. Um, context, it's about food lunches. It's about the the food that uh, schools are procuring um, for for the children. Um, basically, uh, they do only in, in LA uh, unified purchases of food that that are worth a hundred million dollars a year, and they serve a million meals a day. So she's built this um, program uh, where she was an official in the U.S. administration, actually in the local administration, the Good Food Purchasing Program that kind of became a standalone organization which is looking into shifting this institutional purchasing of, of large of, of the school meals in the US and um, they, they've made projections that they're basically going to influence uh, 1.5 billion euros uh, 1.5 billion dollars of um, of um, uh, food spending by 2020 uh, with their with their program because they're you know working with the schools to make uh, choices that lead to to less obesity that lead to more local uh, produce being bought and and all of these things and that's a big lever for change if if the big players um, be it public institutions or you know the 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 big um, uh, purchasers in different markets if they're making a, a difference. And we know we have social entrepreneurs, just as Christina was saying, and different organizations that are working with these players to, to kind of make things more sustainable in the longer run. Okay, thank you very much, Queen. That, that's um, really interesting, but I'm gonna be devil's advocate here. As those of you who know me, I know that I quite like doing that. Um, 
it, this is a wonderful thing if we're sitting in a developed economy that we can somehow or other, you know, think about what we do. But isn't it really, isn't the reality that as more and more of the world um, develops economically, consumer demand is going to go up just as it has for us? Is it realistic, perhaps, David, is it realistic that somehow or other the world's supply chains are, are going to be affected dramatically by these processes of being concerned about how we recycle and shortening our supply chains and things? Or isn't it really the case that corporations, people, the big logistics companies are actually thinking about how we can extend and widen supply chains? How is it really going to work out, David? Isn't this a binary choice in the end? I don't think it's a binary choice, but you've got current situation where you, essentially you've got the haves and the have nots. And those have nots are always going to struggle, um, whether it's from the government side, from corporate side, it, wherever this is going on. Um, you were just talking earlier about mentioning fast fashion and the waste of fast fashion from the Western world it's getting dumped in places like Ghana, where there's 300 million tons of clothes just piled in a landfill. It doesn't get a lot of rain, but people go through and they sell it for pennies. So if I don't know if that's you know the right thing to happen. I hope we can reduce that kind of situation going forward. But likewise, the you mentioned food waste as well. And that is occurring, you know, what makes it out of the fields in the first place. Uh, there's a lot of waste just chopping that off from the bottom of what's available. Uh, the pandemic created another issue with the food because the majority, as Karina mentioned, the majority of food is going through institutional restaurant uh, methods or supply chains, getting to the restaurants, the school districts, uh, making these meals. And when that shut down, they could not, these, the producers, uh, the farmers, could not instantly shift to a consumer food um, basis. It's, it was just too much volume. And they just let stuff go to rot in the fields. Uh, that was happening a lot here in Florida. Uh, they did things on little mi miniature scale. They had little food boxes that you could come and get a vegetable box for $10. But that's nothing compared to what was really wasted uh, in the system. Um, I think another, not the always the have, have nots, but this focus on uh, food miles or at least a new focus, I guess food kilometers, depending on how you want to say it, but getting local product, local produce, as opposed to importing, except, and I think it was Andrea mentioning, you know, are we ready to consume less? You know, we, if we want bananas, we want them all year round. We get strawberries all year round, not just in Wimbledon season in the UK. You know, we, we want all of this. And at the same time, that actually does benefit those places that are lesser developed, that are growing the bananas, growing the strawberries. Um, I was just buying something called key lime, key limes, which you would think come from the Florida Keys, but we were gonna make a key lime pie and the bag says made in Mexico. So, you know, it's, we're going to see uh, continued um, long, long range transportation. And if you cut that off to these other producers in the lesser developed countries, you know, are we now creating a disservice for them because that is their livelihood? You know, if it's chocolate, if it's coffee beans. Um, so on one hand, yes, we'd love to go to local produce, environmentally sound, but at the other hand, economically, you know, what will that do to uh, these 
places where they are growing the product. You had mentioned technology as well, going more digital. Um, an interesting example was off the coast of Somalia the, and Kenya, the small fishermen are actually using their mobile phones and an app to sell their catch before they even get back to shore. And so this is a way that they're able to immediately decide, okay, which port do we go in to deliver our, our fish uh, for the highest rate? So, you know, it, it is going, let's say from not just the Western world, but all of this digitalization is moving around the world and making the connections. And I think uh, we're gonna continue seeing those connections build, but I don't see a way to fully um, say on one hand, yes, sustainable, we don't want to do the transportation, but economically, are you then putting these other economies at risk? So now you back to a trade-off situation. Thank you very much, David. I mean, that's a very interesting dichotomy. And I'd, I'd like Christina because to come on on that in a minute, because I know this, this is an issue that's really kind of central to your business model. But just before you do, Andrea Berry asked a question, um, and, and there was a sort of slight discussion going on on the chat with regard to people's capacity to consume more responsibly. Do you want to develop that a little bit, Andrea? And then perhaps Christina come in on that. Would that be OK? Perfect. Hey, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, so it was more of a point about can we consume less? Because um, uh, there was a discussion, or uh, I think Corina was mentioning this. We should consume less, but can we consume that less? I mean, I believe it takes a lot of uh, maturity and uh, understanding of where you are uh, and what are your true needs uh, in your life uh, in order to make that movement. And I believe that's something that you're quite far off. I mean, it, it's uh, very much related to personal development and not everyone is ready to do that. I mean, people are moving abroad just to be able to have access to more resources in order to consume more in some, uh, in some regards. So maybe uh, that is not maybe the, the starting point, but maybe just understand, not have a target in consuming less, but consuming more responsibly. That was my point. Okay, thank you very much. So maybe, Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. That's, that's a very interesting point you made there. Christina, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, I, I'll come back on that from two perspectives, actually. One very personal and uh, the other one uh, a business-oriented one. Uh, on a personal level, uh, and I'll go, I'll just circulate back as well to what Chris, uh, Corina was saying earlier. I think we can make a change if everyone and each one of us in what we do, it's making a small change every day. Uh, yes, of course, there are many things to, to fix around the world. I don't know. I know we don't have the le same level of responsibility and maybe education and whatsoever. But if nobody's doing anything, just because not everyone is doing it, we will not go, go anywhere. And the reason why I said this is personal, I recently moved to a new house. And one of the choices I've made for, for that house was to buy old, in general, very old furniture. And don't imagine the fancy one when I say old and re repaint it, refurbish it. Because I thought that would be my personal contribution. Yes, there were summer weekends spent on washing, cleaning, painting, watching YouTube videos, but actually it's not that hard it, and it's a pretty cool family. But that was my choice, my personal choice to, to contribute. And now switching back a bit to, to business, I must say I'm pretty excited because I do see a more, let's say interest and commitment from the business environment in terms of circular economy, in, in terms of responsible con consumption and all that connected to it. And why I'm saying this, for Steelcase during time, the, the environmental, social governance, so the ESG topics were and are really important. But we also use, uh, we call it a materiality assessment to help us prioritize these topics 
based on their importance to our shareholders, because at the end, we are a publicly state, stated company and we have a responsibility towards our shareholders. And in, in a recent assessment that, that we've made, we see ranking really high on, on, on the range on the two business value and value to the, to the shareholders, this circular, circular economy. And yes, uh, it, it's funny when I'm thinking because yes, we, we, we sell, sold during time our products and we keep selling them at having the strongest extended warranties in the industry and design. And of course, uh, we build them to last. But the problem is what happens after, I don't know, they are not in trend anymore and so on. So this apparent strength in, in the, that we had uh, at a global level became also sort of a challenge or a, I, I, will, I would even call it a weakness because what do we, do, what do you do with it if they are be, be, um, built to last when the customer do not want them? And we're, what we're actually doing, we are building a collaborative ecosystem. There are partners and dealers to support asset interception. Uh, and at, this can be through reuse, donations, and recycling. Uh, to the extent, uh, to extend the, the uh, useful life of these assets. And really the landfill is really the last option that we consider. So this is what now we are aggressively building or, or intentionally, because maybe aggressive sounds negative, we are really intentionally building to, to extend this, this life cycle. So I think, yeah, depends on us as individuals, as business representatives, um, how do we approach it? Okay, so I'm, sorry, Karina, go ahead. You know, I, I I just want to make two two really short comments to something that that was said earlier. So you've you've mentioned um, and you know this idea that the the developing world is is developing fast, and then no matter how um, much we're able to to reduce consumption and practice more equitable consumption here in the West, um, the uh, developing world is gonna um, um, kind of annihilate that those efforts and. I, I do see where you're coming from, but I also believe that humanity, uh, for, for better or worse, is one of those species that, that can evolve and that can learn uh, from, from its uh, past um, uh, errors. And I do see this happening. And leapfrogging is not a phenomenon that we, we see in a textbook, but we kind of really see it happening. So China at the moment, for instance, is the largest um, a market for for artificial meat um, that's that's growing there because middle class Chinese consumers are realizing the power of, of, of their choice and how, how powerful it would be if they consumed less meat and that's why meat alternatives are actually uh, becoming so popular in China or to give you even a more compelling example. Um, They've uh, um, China has decided to cancel all um, uh, investments abroad in coal and to uh, also replace uh, uh, quite quite fast their local coal-fired electricity production with more sustainable um, electricity sources. So I don't think necessarily that the, the Indias and the Chinas of the world need to repeat the same development pathway as we did. I mean, as a matter of fact, if they did that, it would be a complete disaster for humanity. Um, and then the, the other point is around, I think, responsibility and this time from a more institutional perspective. So, um, okay, definitely like individual consumer choices are hard to nudge. And most likely if I see this um, really fabulously looking strawberries in a supermarket as an individual consumer, I'm gonna uh, purchase them. I mean, personally, myself, I won't. I, for, for many years, I'm eating, um, you know, strawberries only in season. But I mean, I, I definitely understand that the world out there will um, eat strawberries also, uh, also out of season. But as, as a big, you know, um, food company, you really are responsible for your suppliers, for uh, the, the way they're um, using the land for the way they're um, using or not pesticides, um, other dangerous substances for how they're treating their employees and so on. And let's remember that the carbon footprint of a company is not measured only through its direct emissions, but it's really measured through its, um, uh, you know, scope two and scope three emissions. And um, as a matter of fact, all the Western markets, um, EU, and I would say that, that soon many others will, will follow in the sense 
sense of asking companies to reduce their, um, their carbon footprint, not only with their direct emissions, but also working with their suppliers to, to completely change um, and, and reduce the footprint of those suppliers. And actually at Ashoka, we are working with um, large companies from the food system that are now kind of really turning towards more regenerative food systems uh, models. They are looking at social entrepreneurs on how to build those models. And they are looking at, you know, social entrepreneurs that are working with local cocoa farmers or coffee farmers or palm oil farmers. And how do you build those more sustainable supply chains and um, getting certified um, cocoa in your in your chocolate uh, that, that you're selling to UK consumers or getting, you know, certified palm oil in, in the cosmetic products that, that you're uh, building and so on. And I think that th there's a big question of integrity, right? So what do all these certifications mean, whether they're for real or not? But I, I, I do not know of a single large multinational that is now not working actively with its suppliers towards um, improving um, the, the usage of water, of resources, of soils, of uh, um, animals and, and so on. So I think, you know, even if the individual consumers are, are slower to move because you really need this mass mentality, again, when we're talking about tipping points and levers for change, these large players are, are acting. Okay, um, I'm going to be extreme. Thank you for that, Karina. I'm going to be controversial here. Um, I, I have a book coming out in March called Rethinking Leadership for a Green World, which I'm the editor of. Um, and my point of view, um, I'm, I'm going to just express what I wrote there. And deliberately, this is quite controversial. But I would suggest to you that, in fact, we're not really going to do anything meaningful except at the margins unless we rethink um, all of our basic assumptions about the position of humanity with regard to nature that we've held since the Enlightenment. And basically, unless we accept that man is that humanity rather than man, sorry, humanity is not the master of nature, but actually is actually its servant. And in factual fact, we're deeply connected in nature and we don't control it. And the whole idea of supply chain surely is about control of nature. Unless we question those fundamental assumptions, we're not meaningfully going to do anything, are we? And I put that out there as a general question, and I know it's provocative. So anybody would like to come back on that? Um, I, I think you really, uh, I, I'm going to send you, Andy and everybody else, actually, um, the, the link to, to the vision that we articulated on Planet at Climate at Ashoka, because our vision is actually, we are nature. That's what, that's what we are, um, uh, that, that's what, that, that, this is, in my mind, the largest mindset shift that needs to occur. And it's about, it's, you know, reverse engineering uh, centuries of culture. I think it's even before the Enlightenment age, Andy. Remember, there, there's a tenet in the Bible, which says, you know, like, grow, multiply, and conquer the earth. Humankind has always regarded itself as this superior species that's supposed to extract nature for its own benefits. And now, but, but we cannot, but, but you know, nature and the planet is gonna perform fabulously well without humankind, but humankind as a species is not gonna be able to live without all the other species around us because we are intricately related to each and every species in our ecosystem. We are nature, we are part of this web of life. And I think when we're going to, to get to this level of consciousness uh, and it's a renewed consciousness, we are going to change the way we're making decisions because we're not gonna be able to inflict harm on ourselves. But I really uh, am eagerly waiting for your book because um, it, it uh, echoes so much the, the thinking that we've been uh, putting together in the past year and a half. We are nature, um, as simple as that. Um, okay, interesting. David, over to you. Yeah, that just reminds me, as you say, we are nature. But uh, when I've been teaching some aspects of the sustainability, I come back to the triple bottom line because you have to keep, in fact, uh, a firm to be profitable in the long run, otherwise it will not keep going as a going concern. Then you also look at the environmental impact, but also the societal impact, whether that's you know, polluting the water, having a negative effect on the human health uh, as part of this. So you've got the three that all have to be balanced. And I think more and more, we are seeing that the profitable side, uh, the financial side, is being benefited by 
looking at environmental and societal solutions, you get rewarded from society by being environmentally um, proficient and leading on that front. You're finding more and more firms when you move to solar or wind or renewable energy, it's a big investment up front, but the ongoing reduces that use of the, the carbon uh, fuels. So we're seeing benefits and I think more and more firms are looking that way. I wanted to come back to one thing Christina also said about the circular economy. And I was going to give a quick example because we look at recycling. And one of my hobbies um, on the side is I fix these little Garmin bicycle things. I don't know if you can <laughs> see these. Um, and so I buy broken ones, either the software or it needs a new screen. But over the last years, if I put up an old one, you'll see that there's little screws that are there so I can take the case apart. The new ones are just glued on and basically when they go bad, they're designed to be thrown away. And so, and this is not to say, you know, Garmin is the only one that I'm, you know, <laughs> pointing them out specifically, but they're the ones that I've been uh, playing with. And I'm finding it actually harder now because of the way they have created these as sealed units. Essentially, when they break, throw them away, send them back to Garmin, they'll throw it away and send you a, a replacement within the warranty period. But no longer, you know, is, is it easy enough for me to just replace the back of a case, a new screen, a new button, um, as easily as I can with the new ones. It's, uh, you know, almost a, the reverse of what should be happening. That's very interesting and very relevant in Europe, David. I don't know um, if you're aware, but certainly um, Apple have just been forced very much against their will by the European Commission to make their products repairable um, yes. and to actually provide spare parts for at least authorized repairers. And it's very much, get, you know, Apple fought extremely hard to stop this, um, but they ultimately have lost. Um, and this seems to me to go to the heart of the tension. And um, maybe Christina, these are, you wanna come in on this because I'm guessing that this is an issue which in the furniture business really goes to the heart of your business model. So um, actually when uh, I've seen the example with the electronics, uh, not sure if it's visible, I'm not sure about the, the image, the, the background uh, and the chairs, let's say that I have. So that perch, this it's, called perch stool that I have in the background next uh, next to me. I think it's a it's a it's a good example of um, a product actually that it's 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 using only uh, and is created only from past consumer waste electronics production. So it's totally from recycled uh, material. And at the end of life, when we get rid of it, it's totally recyclable on its own as well. It's a, it's a new process. It's called sea cycling. Uh, I cannot say that, um, again, uh, Steelcase owns it and so on. It's actually one of our customers, BASF, one, one of the largest, yes, chemical producers in, in the world, uh, has came with this proposal to us. If you would like to have this joint venture, and uh, here it is, will be launched in, in January. What I'm saying is that I think only to get, we don't have the expertise, let's say each one of us separately to think in terms of product and consumption in terms of new materiality. Uh, but together, I think we can challenge ourselves in actually reusing, not only through a prolonged life cycle, but really giving a different purpose, increase the level of, of recycling uh, and give a different use to this product. And yes, I think this knowledge is important. I think we still need to grow it, but also we need to partner and challenge as well ourselves in, in, in 
thinking differently of going maybe with different types of materials that that we were used to to have so far. Um, that's a really interesting perspective, Christina. And um, you know, one of the thing, um, part of my background is I used to be um, an emissions trader. And um, one of the really interesting things that's come out of that pioneering emissions trading market that was born in the Kyoto, which was very much a forerunner of the recent COP summit in Glasgow, um, is there was an, been an une unexpected huge spin-off by adjusting the way people thought, particularly finance managers, the way they thought about waste and the opportunity that emission markets, emissions markets created to think about waste to fuel and Re, re, reconceptualizing what was waste as a potential asset. Um, and this has been quite dramatic. And it, although the idea of questioning our ethical position in regards to nature is a fascinating theoretical question, the real question is how do we actually do that in a market-based economy? And so things like emissions trading have been very, very powerful things in, in sort of acting as a catalyst for adjusting not just our actions, but our whole mindset. So. Um, I don't know who, if anybody wants to come back on thinking a little bit about that, because maybe that's a useful way to kind of bring this debate to a conclusion. I, I, I mean, I, I think I've said it earlier on, and it's like, you know, climate change is really the biggest market failure that we've experienced um, as humanity. And I, I really feel it's the uh, responsibility of the market to, to fix that. And what I've seen happening at, at Glasgow, um, as you said, Andy, you know, as a follow up to Kyoto, the fact that they finally closed Article Seven of the Paris Agreement, Article Six of the Paris Agreement on voluntary carbon markets and on the the, account the accountancy of carbon, I think that's really going to create a breakthrough. The carbon credits market was worth a billion last year, but um, it's going to to be even more than that. And of course, I think integrity here is really a key issue, you know, not to purchase the same ton of carbon offset twice and so on and so forth. But still, um, this is really where we're going to, to see a difference being made, uh, creating the, the market-based incentives uh, to keep carbon into the ground or to suck carbon out of the atmosphere uh, by um, this, this race to net zero that governments and corporations have uh, rallied behind. Um, and another thing, um, building on what David was saying earlier around, you know, uh, long term profitability and long term thinking, I really this, I, I really feel this is where it, it's crucial to extend our current economic thinking beyond the, the NPL, beyond the one year planning, beyond the two year planning. And um, if, if we do that, we're going to compare have a completely different pricing equation because assets which we think nowadays make sense on our balance sheet are not going to make sense any longer in 10 years from now in 15 years from now because th that carbon um, uh, that those assets uh, will be releasing in the atmosphere doesn't make any sort of sense so they're actually you know sunk assets and i think this is really where um uh, our um and we have, you know, a Shoka fellows in our network that are actually working with corporations to incorporate these climate liabilities on their balance sheet. And if that's going to happen, if these carbon intensive assets are going to incorporate it to be incorporated on the balance sheet of large corporations, then we're going to see divestments. And we're already seeing these divestments happening. Uh, and this is uh, all due to the, you know, carbon economy, which I, I totally agree with you. It has created a difference. Um, and in the EU, we are seeing this new economic model of, of the Green Deal coming up because of the carbon pricing, essentially. Um, and we're going to see more and more of that uh, into the future. Okay, thank you very much, Karina. I think you're, I think you're, you know, you're, the way you're thinking is exactly right. And I hope that I hope that people here um, today, I hope it's kind of clear that, that whilst there aren't very easy answers to these to the questions that we're kind of trying to address here, either in terms of pure business based supply chain problems, or the ecological consequences of those chains. What is important is our capacity to think about problems of disruption and complexity in a more critical way. And I'm going to conclude this debate by, by um, suggesting that for those of you that would like to think more about these questions, do come to us at Transylvania Executive Education. We are here developing programs 
around these questions, you know, we do have an MBA program with the University of Buckingham that is going to be starting in February, where the central focus of this program is around questions of systemic complexity and governance. So these are questions which are about improving economic entrepreneurial performance, but in the context of those questions of societal and ecological impact. We have a number of executive programs around strategy, um, sustainability, and complexity. And further more than that, at the end of the day, we're a not-for-profit organization which is here to facilitate more critical thinking at a global level around these kind of questions. So do come to us because whilst we may not be able to offer you solutions, we are able to connect you to people that might be able to help, help you think about those problems more effectively and connect you to people who can contribute to those solutions. So I do hope that this has been an enjoyable and a valuable discussion for everybody. Um, do stay in contact with us, do look at our website. For those of you that are interested in my attempt to directly plug a book that I genuinely think might be valuable, do have, keep an eye on our site because when we launch this book, many of the people that will be contributing to the MBA, such as Professor David Grant, that I know David Menikoff knows, I know Talk Christina, people like that, Amanda Gregory, for those of you who remember her on strategy, um, Yasmin Morali on complexity, Angela Espinosa on systems, all of these people are contributing to this volume as a way of helping and encouraging people not just to provide solutions, but think, but create frameworks for thinking about these kind of topics. We like to be a hub to help you engage in those kind of questions. So do stay in touch. And as I say, I do hope this was a valuable and enjoyable discussion for everybody. And it really just remains me to give a very, very big thank you to Karina, Christina and David. Thank you so much for your time and I hope it was a valuable experience for you also. Thank you all very much for taking part today.